Thank you everyone for tuning into today's fireside chat. We have a very special program for you today. I am Stephen Burke, Group Director for the Trademark Law Offices at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and it is my pleasure to introduce our host and guest today. First is Commissioner for Trademarks, Dave Gooder, a longtime IP attorney and trademark practitioner who took the helm of, of, of the Trademark Office a year ago, March. Dave is leading the Trademark Office during a period of a large increase in the volume of trademark applications due to the growth of e-commerce, the desire of many Americans to start their own companies and launch new products, and the rapid globalization of brands, among other factors. He is also overseeing the adoption of what some have called the most significant trademark legislation of the past 75 years, that being the Trademark Modernization Act of 2020. Suffice it is to say, Dave is a very busy person, and we thank him for his time today. He is joined by Dana Josefsik, who became Associate General Counsel for Intellectual Property for the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee in September 2019. Dana was previously a partner at Merton and Gould's Trademark Group in Denver, Colorado. And at the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, Dana's focus is on brand protection and enforcement. And Dana, I imagine you are as equally busy as Dave um, <laughs> because of the Summer Olympics coming up. So again, so like Dave, we thank you very much for your time today. Um, and like everybody out there, I think, we're very excited to have our athletes going to Tokyo this year, joining the ranks of past notables such as Jesse Owens, Muhammad Ali, Mary Lou Retton, Sugar Ray, Ren Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, just to name a few. Our athletes will be competing in various sports such as track and field, swimming, gymnastics, and the list goes on and on. Each of these sports and others are supported by their own brands and through trademarks. And I would note many of these activities such as extreme sports are growing and catching on like wildfire. At the Trademark Office, we recognize the importance of all sports and recreation brands to the U.S. economy. In fact, we will soon be launching a new Trademarks and in Sports initiative aimed at educating the public about the importance of sports brands and trademarks. We hope to inspire more Americans to become engaged in the many facets of the fast-growing sports and recreation economy, so please be on the lookout for that in the coming months. Okay, time permitting, um, we'll, we will take questions uh, in a question and answer session at the end. Um, so. Um, before I hand things over, um, the mailbox address for you to submit questions is OCCOfeedback at USPTO.gov. Let me repeat that again. It is OCCOfeedback at USPTO.gov, and we'll try to catch as many questions as we can at the end. With that, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Dave and Dana. Thank you both, and we look forward to your insights and conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, very much. Dana, welcome. It's great to, it's great, great to see you. Um, as we're all doing these things, and uh, but welcome and thanks for taking the time to do this. Absolutely, thank you so much, Commissioner Gooder. This is a pleasure. Yeah, please call me Dave. Commissioner <laughs> Gooder always sounds like my dad. Um, anyway. I know we've been over that before. I just always forget. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I always love finding out about people who are doing interesting things is how what's the path you traveled to get to where you are. I mean, I know you were in private practice, but but what 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 got you to the USOPC and doing what you do now? Sure, happy to talk about that. Um, so I grew up in upstate New York. I grew up playing, you know, sports, volleyball, softball, soccer. I was not a stellar athlete by any means, but I enjoyed playing sports. And I loved every two years when the Olympics uh, came on. I loved watching with my family. I loved watching with my friends. Uh, being being around the world of sports and participating in sports was definitely something that I feel like was a forging element in my life growing up. Um, after I graduated high school, I went to school in Boston. I went to undergrad at Boston College. And when I first uh, matriculated at BC, I thought I wanted to pursue a pre-med path. Um, so I did all the things that you do your freshman, your sophomore year when you're looking to be pre-med. Um, I came to the realization at some point at the end of my sophomore year that the pre-med path was not for me. Um, however, by this time, I had already engaged in a number of science courses as well with a number of math courses. And the combination of the two of them actually led me into the world of computer programming and bioinformatics. So kind of programming genes and proteins and and that stuff. So all of this put together during undergrad um, weirdly piqued my interest in patent law. Uh, I thought to myself that, you know, technology and science and being to, able to approach it from a legal perspective would be a fascinating career path. So I ended up at CU Boulder. I, um, I That's where I went to law school. I had an uncle who lived in the Denver area at the time, and Boulder is a gorgeous place to spend a couple of years. So uh, I 
I went to law school there. And when I was at CU, I started interning at a law firm, uh, Merchant and Gould. It's a Minneapolis based law firm, but it's an intellectual property boutique. Uh, so when I started my career at Merchant, I focused on patent law, very, very heavy in the computer software space. And I spent about the first four to five years of my career doing patent law. Um, at some point during that time, I realized that I was not a patent lawyer. I didn't want to be a patent lawyer. I wanted to do something else. Uh, but my mindset at the time was very myopic. I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, if I'm not going to be a patent lawyer, can I still do law? In retrospect, it was it was a very strange way to think. That being said, um, my managing partner at Merchant at the time, uh, he was not quite as short-sighted, and he kind of encouraged me to join our trademark group, which was based out of Minneapolis. Um, you know, this was all pre-COVID. This is before remote work kind of became the norm. So having the Minneapolis, the trademark group based in Minneapolis and me being in Denver, um, it did take a little bit on my part to go back and forth. I started flying out to Minneapolis, um, meeting the folks there, becoming part of that team. Um, on my side, they really mentored me, took me under their wing, taught me trademark law, enforcement, brand protection, all the things that I would eventually end up doing as a career. Um, so I worked in that trademark group out of the Denver office uh, for, I think, about five maybe, five or six years. I'm not sure about that exactly, um, but really had an opportunity to kind of build our Denver-based trademark group, which was an incredible, incredible chance in my life. Um, we got to focus on Denver-based clients, building our Denver-based trademark practice, and thinking about how we wanted to approach brand strategy through our Denver office, um, which was great. Uh, about a time, about a year before I took the job at USOPC, I saw my general counsel speak at a sports law forum. I think it was at the Rocky Mountain IP Institute, actually. And I remember thinking to myself, "Gosh, that would be such a neat job if I could if I could get that IP job at USOPC. That would be really cool." Lo and behold, a year later, it came up, and I ended up here. That's a great path. I remember when that job got posted and, and a lot of people looked at it and said, wow, what a, what a fabulous job and, and a great place to live. And, and uh, so you obviously dazzled everybody because you're here. So uh, that's, a, that's great. Is there, if you look back at all these things that you did before, what's the, if you, if you had to pick out one thing that really has impacted how you do your work now, um, what, what would it be, do you think? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So I actually think the thing that impacts most is none of the things that I just spoke about. Um, throughout my life, despite picking a communications based career, I've always struggled with teaching others. I've had a hard time kind of verbalizing my thought process. So I'd never been able to tutor other people or kind of explain the way I was reasoning or thinking. This is not a great asset for a lawyer, by the way. Um, and at some time <laughs> when I was working at Merchant, I had the opportunity to teach at CU Law. It wasn't a full-time professor. It was it was an ad, I kind of, I guess I was a guest teacher um, for a couple of classes. And that kind of gave me the opportunity to practice more of this educational approach, a better way of explaining myself, a better way of communicating the way I'm thinking, um, especially to law students, um, folks who were not kind of as like deep in the trademark IP space at that time, but were trying to figure out what path of law they'd like to pursue and where they'd like their life to go. So I've, I've always been really, really grateful for my opportunity to teach at CU, um, in large part because I help, I think that it helped me become someone who can better explain where I'm coming from, better explain the why behind, you know, why we're, what we're doing and why we're acting in the way that we're acting. And a lot of what my current role is right now is we do a lot of education. Um, there's a lot of communication about our enforcement strategy, the way that we approach our brands, um, and the reasoning behind, you know, the way that we take certain actions that we take. And so I do feel like my time teaching help me develop some skills where I could actually talk to people and have them understand, you know, kind of the why. And have people shooting questions back at you and things like that and <laughs> keeping a challenge. Well, okay, so speaking of enforcement, you, you, you've got a fairly big challenge coming up in this this summer. Um, the, the Tokyo games are, what, a little over a month away. And um, no doubt you and your team are gearing up for all that. Tell us a little bit about, you know, your your approach to brand protection, brand enforcement in and around the, the, the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games. 
Yeah, so um, our approach really is highly focused, as I just mentioned, on education. Um, one thing that a lot of folks are not aware of is that the USOPC is a nonprofit organization. We do not receive taxpayer funding. We don't receive government assistance. Um, we are an organization that relies on our sponsors and our fundraising to send Team USA athletes to the games. So this is something that a lot of people are not aware of. And it's something, again, in my educational approach to brand enforcement that I like to explain to folks. Because of the way that we're structured, because we're a nonprofit entity, Congress set us up in a manner whereby we have exclusive rights to certain intellectual property. And the statute that set us up in this capacity is, a, is an act called the Ted Stevens Act. Well, it's actually called the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. I'm going to shorthand that, David, for, <laughs> for this conversation. Thank I'm just going to call it the Ted Stevens Act. No problem. Um, so the Ted Stevens Act recognizes the way that we function as an organization. And because we are not you know, receiving any sort of taxpayer monies, it set us up in a manner so that we have the exclusive right to use certain terms commercially in the United States. And those marks include Olympic, Paralympic, Paralympiad, Olympiad, Sidious Altius Fortius, Pan American, and Parapan American. They also include the iconic symbols such as the Olympic rings and the Paralympic Aguidos. So the reason why that this structure is so important is by giving USOPC the exclusive right to use and authorize others to use these marks, Congress enabled us to kind of have a very strong sponsorship and licensing structure whereby we can ensure to our sponsors and our licensees that they have the right to use certain marks in certain categories um, and that we as the USOPC will be able to enforce if third parties use those same marks in an unauthorized manner. So a lot of what I'm doing right now, Dave, is talking to folks, explaining why we're organized the way that we're organized and explaining the why and be, be behind why we reach out. So you really kind of almost got a, a dual dual view of this i mean you have you're a brand owner um but you also have these sponsors who are kind of a, a special part of what you do as well How, that's a lot of people yeah. to keep happy yeah it is you know but it's i think it's i think it's a great way to look at it because to me the way that you enforce a brand is really you're protecting the goodwill associated with the mark and there's many ways that you kind of look at that i mean from the one perspective uh, you don't want a third party to affiliate, you know, itself with your brand in a way that you don't authorize, in a way that could cause your company harm. Um, and at, uh, on the other hand, you also don't want third parties to commercialize your brand. And the fact that we have sponsor considerations just built kind of nicely into that niche at the USOPC, we were able to enforce our brand for, for our benefit and also to enable these relationships to continue so that we can continue to send Team USA athletes to the games, um, train them feed them, all of that stuff that enables us to have a very strong team. Yeah. So it, like a number of brands, it seems to me that you all have you all have fans. Um, and fans can become infringers, but they're a different breed. And it's not like a normal. How? What's been your approach to dealing with, let's call them, un, some people call them unintentional yeah. infringers, fan infringers. Um, that kind of and that's a great question and it really runs the gambit um on the one hand we receive a lot of proactive requests which is great um we have brand usage guidelines that are public on our website and there's an email address associated with those guidelines um and so we do receive a lot of folks who are trying to do the right thing a lot of emails from people saying hey i would like to throw an event in my town i'd like to sell olympic t-shirts is this okay um, and it gives me an opportunity to not only explain the why behind we would ask that they not do that, but it also kind of addresses the problem before it happens, which is nice. I mean, the, it, it, it's always more frustrating to have to deal with these things when they're already in the middle of being launched. Um, so okay. so that's kind of like the, the first way that we tend to interact with fans is folks who are proactive, but there's a lot of people who aren't proactive and frankly Dave the vast majority of these folks aren't aren't intending they're trying to celebrate the games and it's just they're doing it in a way that doesn't exactly work within our brand structure and brand guidelines so we have to you know work with people at that point to use marks or not use marks in a way that is kind of appropriate with with how we utilize our brand 
Do, do you find that when you talk to folks, we company I used to work for had a similar issue, and I found that when we talked to people, oftentimes they 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 were they would say, "Oh gosh, I didn't realize it was would, how it was how that was harmful to the brands. I I never intended to do that." Do you get the same so much of that. from people? It, it's it's really common, and the requests like they they really span the board here. I mean, we get requests about all different types of things. I mean, one of the most common requests that I get is people who would like to use our mark or a simulation of the rings or a simulation of the Aguitos on apparel. Um, oftentimes, Dave, what happens is there's someone's birthday party or or there's a summer camp or there someone knows someone who's going to the games and wants to make a line of t-shirts so their friends and family can support that athlete. So oftentimes this really does fall under the under the umbrella of fan engagement. Um, so we do try to wo work with folks and have kind of clear brand guidelines as to what is okay with our IP and what we ask that you not do. And we, we do ask that folks don't put our intellectual property on apparel and shirts. And the reasoning behind this is similar to what I just explained. We have uh, relationships with sponsors and licensees and we authorize them to use our marks on apparel and clothing, so we can't really authorize third parties to do the same. Uh, but understanding the why behind it does help, and and a lot of people, once they hear the reasoning behind the the no, um, are are very very quick to say, okay, I had no idea. Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, yeah, which is great. You you're you're touching on something that I I find really interesting and something that you know as I work through the years started to pay more attention to and that's sort of this concept of the the enforcement philosophy that you have as a brand or as an organization um and tell us a little bit about what your the philosophy you 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 all adopt or how it evolves and and when you when you in in the enforcement space absolutely my, i mean my personal uh, theory or, or thoughts on enforcement is that it, it serves a dual role. On the one hand, you know, it, it does preserve the exclusivity of a brand, but oftentimes to me, how you enforce and how you communicate your messaging also says a lot about what your brand stands for. Um, so from our side, it, as I mentioned, a lot of people use our marks in a way that they don't realize is not okay, but they're doing it because they're excited about the games. They're excited that their friend is a Paralympian. They're excited that the, the Tokyo games are happening. Um, and, and it's out of excitement and it's out of fan engagement. So it's, it's, it's really a dual message. On the one hand, we really want to encourage folks to, to keep the spirit and the enthusiasm for the games alive, to celebrate that within their communities and with their friends. Um, but at the same time, we have to we have to monitor our brand so that it's used appropriately in, in these different capacities. Um, and this and this can be this can show its way itself in so many different arenas, Dave. Um, I get questions a lot about people who want to throw Olympic events, who are working at a company and internally what they'd like to do is have a be an Olympic themed um, Q2 meeting with their marketing team. Uh, these are things that we try to work with people and we say, hey, we understand that this is not commercial. We understand that, you know, this is this is not something that you're going out and selling. But again, these marks are preserved for our sponsors and our licensees, and we have to be really careful about how we authorize their use. Um, so we just ask people to move away from our marks and to move away from events which may use the brands or may put them on apparel or merchandise or promotions or any of those things. Um, so, so it's a conversation that we do have and we have frequently, but I always try to start the conversation with thank you so much for your enthusiasm and support for the for the movement, because I do believe the vast majority of the time that's that's where these that's where these actions stem from. Yeah, and it sure makes a sets a different tone in an enforcement case when that's how you're starting it. So, Dave, you mentioned that you used to have fan engagement at a company that you worked for. How did you how did you deal with it? Well, yeah, you had you had um, people who were huge loyal fans of a, of a brand. I mean, to the point where they would tattoo it on themselves. And um, you, you, a lot of times, you 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 just real. We realized over time that there were there were just a category of of people who were, like you said, fans who just didn't realize that what they were doing was wrong, and they appreciated taking a tone with them that was like, look, we just need to stop it, and here's why. And usually they they immediately realized it, and that grew and grew so to the point where we realized, all right, 
let's adopt um, enforcement policies that are related to that thinking by group because every group has a little bit of a different issue. Um, and and it, it, it really, I mean, it seemed to really help and, and every once in a while, you know, those things go viral and it, when you when you come out of it with people thinking more of your brand because of how you handled it, like you say, it's it's not it's not just what it speaks loudly about about who you are and what your brand is. So I you're you're obviously doing a good job with it because I looked on various trademark bully lists and you're not on them. Um so you're 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 obviously doing walking the right line with this and then people are appreciating it. Well I'm gonna take that as a win. Um one of the things that I found to be really helpful in the way that you communicate things is, I mean, this is just something that I've found in life. It's really hard to communicate appropriate tone through email, especially when you're asking someone to stop doing something. Um, even if you don't intend to, you can sound angry, you can sound directive. Um, so what I try to do is get people on the phone as quickly as possible. Um, typically, if I can get folks on the phone after one email exchange, it, it, goes, it goes much smoother. Now that doesn't happen 100% of the time, but I've noticed that I'm batting better than average right now for getting people on the phone and having and having the result being something that is not only resolved quickly, but I feel like the person on the other line felt heard and respected because that is that's very, very important to us as an organization. We we want our fans to celebrate the games, but we need to make sure that it's done in the appropriate manner. And do you find that those people tend to become um tell you about all sorts of other infringement that <laughs> You read my mind. Yes, that does happen. Um, so there's there's kind of two camps here, and and I'm sure that you've seen the same thing in your practice as well, Dave. There's there's the first camp, which you call someone and you say, "Hey, um, we became aware of this issue. Um, I don't know if you know this, but we own the Mark Olympic, and here's here's kind of how we're set up and the why behind it." Um, and so we'd we'd ask that you know you move away from this particular promotion or whatever it is. And you kind of get two answers. The first is, okay, I'm so, you know, I'm so sorry. And the second is, yeah, but the guy down the road's doing it too. Um, in which case, you know, we have the classic conversation of, well, it doesn't make, just because he's doing it, doesn't mean that it's okay that you do it, but please send me what you're talking about and I'll look into it as well. Um, so I, I get some of that. I also get some of um, when, when I work through something with someone, a couple of months down the line, sometimes people are like, hey, I came across these things, this might be problematic. And I'm thankful for that. I mean, we, we can only handle the issues that we're aware of. Um, yeah. And it's, it's something that we have to approach on a case by case basis. So when people send me in things that they're concerned about, sometimes it's not trademark infringement day, but sometimes it is and it's something that we have to handle. Do you find you get uh, athletes sending you things that they've seen that they kind of think maybe that infringes, or, or does it tend to be employees, or who who tends to be your 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 good, one of your big sources of information? Oh gosh, it really it spans the gamut. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a legal IP email address that's part of our brand usage guidelines. So what usually ends up happening is people who are reviewing the brand usage guidelines, which ends up being folks who are trying to follow the rules. Um, because if you're looking up our brand guidelines, you're trying to do it right. Try, um, yeah. They'll they'll send me a note asking about something and I'll say, oh, well, no, we actually don't. Some people just kind of keep an eye out for anything that they perceive to be a misuse of Olympic properties and report it as well. Um, it really, there are a number of different ways that we find out about stuff. Um, some of the other ways that um, actually tend to lead towards a quicker resolution are uh, the USPTO actually is one of the ways that I find out about a lot of this stuff because people file applications for marks that include Olympic or Paralympic or a simulation of the rings. And um, the USPTO will refuse an application if, if it deems that it violates the Ted Stevens Act. Um, it's it's kind of a statutory bar, Dave, because it's it's a use requirement, and without our authorization, a third party is not supposed to use those marks. So it's it's a good thing at the USPTO to get those flags because sometimes, especially maybe if these conversations are a little bit more challenging, if the person on the other end of the call doesn't necessarily agree with me or or, or whatever their perspective may be, to not only hear it from me, but then to also get a refusal from the USPTO, sometimes kind of drives the point home of like, okay, it's not just the USOPC that's saying this, it's the USPTO. Right, right. 
And, and I, I, I think a lot of practitioners, and, until you bump into the Ted Stevens Act for some reason, you, you, you may not know about it. And, and so you're right. That's you don't. I mean, yeah, I remember, yeah. this is a little embarrassing, but I remember it was about two months before I applied for this job. At my old firm, there was a client that wanted some sort of thing that could have been a simulation of the rings. And I thought, ah, oh, how does Olympic IP, this is before the job was posted. And I was like, oh no, that's not gonna work. Those, those are not enumerated in the act, nor is our Team USA brand. Um, so these are these are things that are not covered under the act and like every other trademark owner out there we file federal trademark applications for them and we pursue those marks through the lanham act um so we do have a number of marks that are covered by the ted stevens act but we also have a number of marks that fall under the typic the typical confines of the lanham act um so that's how we kind of go about securing and protecting those there is a part of the ted stevens act that uh, it includes a provision that authorizes the USOPC to file a civil lawsuit for unauthorized use of, you know, the enumerated tor terms or of any trademark, trade name, sign, symbol, or insignia falsely representing association with or authorization by the IOC, the IPC, Pan American Sports Organization, um, or the USOPC. So in many ways, marks like Tokyo 2020 and Team USA um, are, are affiliated with USO, USOPC in the games yeah. and are associated with us. So, so there is that part of the Ted Stevens Act, which does provide that additional civil recourse. So you actually provide help on that front in the US, even though Tokyo 2020 is, is not necessarily a mark you all that's right. It, it's, it's interesting. So that leads me to two, two, two questions about some interesting things about the act, given that there is an enormous part of the US that is goes under the name of the Olympics, the, I, I, the Olympic Mountains. And one of those is, I, I had heard one time that there was a, a grandfathering in at the time the act was passed. Can you, can you talk at all about that, that limitation or what, how that works? Absolutely. So uh, when the Ted Stevens was, Act was passed, they included some language in there to grandfather in prior rights. And so this doesn't, Dave, this doesn't kind of address, address the ge geographic question, but there's kind of two parts that are grandfathered in in this particular case. Um, the first is pre-existing rights for folks who have used um, some of the terms that are delineated in the Act prior to 1950. And what the Act says is, you know, people who have been using those specific marks prior to 1950 may continue doing so pretty much in the same capacity. Um, so, you know, that that definitely does apply in some instances, and there are some companies that fall under that grandfather in basis. Uh, the second carve out is the geographic scope of which you just mentioned. So in Washington state, there is an area uh, west of the Cascade Mountains that can geographically be referred to as Olympic. And so the act has a carve out for that particular region of the US as well. Um, so if a mark includes the term Olympic and the business associated with the mark uh, operates within the state of Washington, west of the Cascade Mountain Range, then the use of Olympic can be considered in that specific case. Um, there are some limits on that particular geographic carve out. Um, for example, the goods and services sold by that business must be within the state of Washington and sales marketing operations outside of the area cannot be substantial. Um, so as you can probably guess, it's, it's usually leaves some questions to people who fall into this carve out, um, especially with regard to things like websites. Um, things like, things like, you know, I'm running a business and I am running a local sightseeing business west of the Cascade Mountains, uh, but we do have folks coming in from out of town and I'd like a website because I'd like people to book reservations on it. Um, so this is something that, you know, we do evaluate on a case by case basis and we really kind of look at whether the brunt of the activities are within the state of Washington or really whether it's a, it's a national company that just happens to be headquartered west of those Cascades. Gotcha. So what happens though in a, in a, in a corporate transaction, if somebody is acquiring one of those grandfathered companies, let's say either geographically or, or, or from a time period, um, has, how does that, how does that play with an acquisition? So the act does, uh, specify a situation whereby if you assign your grandfathered in rights, your rights that existed prior to 1950, um, the assignees who offer the same goods and services, and that's important, 
um, are also grandfathered in under the act. Um, what we see sometimes is people changing up their business model, expanding the scope of the goods and services that they offer. One of the things I also have seen a little bit of is when there hasn't been an assignment of rights, Dave, but rather when there's just been sort of a license of those rights. So if an entity that's grandfathered in has its rights and let's say, for example, the term Olympic, um, and and you know is is still operating within the same goods and services that it has always operated in. Um, sometimes I've seen situations where that entity says to a third party, "Oh yeah, it's good. You can just use use my mark in this other capacity." And and that's really something that we do push back on. And and it, it has to be it, the the act authorizes an assignment, um, not not a license. So it's one of these things where you know we do look at it at a case by case basis, but it's it's it can be challenging especially if people want to expand the business model to a different scope that that may fall out of the grandfather clause yeah it's such an interesting aspect because it's just not something that most people are dealing with in a transaction or most brand owners don't have that kind of situation um, to deal with but um let's turn to the word olympian and the and 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 kind of the the the, the people an olympian someone who competes um and is that covered by the act as well? So the act does cover, you know, simulations of certain marks. Um, Olympian in and of itself is not called out by the act. Um, Olympian is a simulation of Olympic though. Um, so we do use the Ted Stevens act with regard to that particular term, um, but you sort of just identified the, the balance here with the term Olympian. It is, on the one hand, if it's used as a brand, if it's used as in a commercial entity, it could be something that may infringe on the rights of the USOPC. But on the other hand, if it's being used to describe a person, that description could very well be in a biographical manner that's factual. So we try to strike a balancing approach here. Um, for athletes that are Olympians or Paralympians, um, if, if they refer to themselves in a factual manner as an Olympian or Paralympian, uh, we, we ask that that reference be made in a balanced way. So what that kind of means is other achievements are, or other accolades are listed. So for example, this athlete in question could say Olympian, world champion, um, mother of three, or something along those lines um, that, that talk more about the person. And so that particular promotional use is not something that feels like it's trading off of Olympic IT quite as much. It's almost kind of a... a thinking along in a sort of a fair use way of, of somebody who says, yes, I worked for so-and-so or I, it, it's factually accurate. So does it, how then does this connect with the sponsor world? Because we, there's clearly sponsors of the, the, the Olympic, the, the movement at an international level, at the US level, et cetera, but athletes um, also have, have their own sponsors, which is how they can afford to get where they're, where they're, where they're going a lot of times. How does that dynamic work between athletes and their sponsors, um, their per personal sponsors, as especially as you're kind of heading into that world right now? Yeah, so um, again, really our big question here is the trading off the Olympic goodwill um, by a third party who is not a USOPC sponsor. So, you know, oftentimes we do work with athletes and their personal sponsors on campaigns that include a factual reference to an achievement. Um, but we ask again that that approach be balanced. So if, if, an, if a company is sponsoring an individual athlete and that athlete is an Olympian or a Paralympian, uh, describing that achievement in a factual way um, is something that we do work with them on. And we try to work on campaigns proactively so that other achievements are included. And the trading off the Olympic goodwill thing just doesn't, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like the company is trading off Olympic goodwill or associating themselves with the USOPC. Yeah, because it's a fascinating thing because you, you see this, especially I would guess the closer you get to the games, those individual sponsors want to be able to acknowledge their their connection to this athlete and et cetera. And I understand there's something called for at the IOC level called Rule 40. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, there is. I'll get to Rule 40 in a second. I just wanted to, if you don't mind, touch on yeah, one no. other aspect that we do see kind of the Olympian, uh, Paralympian biographical reference piece being used quite a bit. Um, and that's and that's really in the worlds of of fundraising and other third parties kind of using 
uh, speaking engagements or fundraising opportunities whereby athletes are participated, participating or part of these organizations. Um, and part of the fundraising, you know, is going to reference that the athlete is an Olympian or a Paralympian. It's a very similar analysis in this one, Dave. Um, we ask that fundraising initiatives so they don't trade off USOPC goodwill also list kind of the athlete's achievements in a balanced matter and not other you otherwise use USOPC IP. So there's it comes it comes in in a whole bunch of different ways. <laughs> and it's probably one of the more common questions that we see. Oh, I would think so, especially because the, the, the pool of athletes, so to speak, of Olympians just, you know, grows constantly and changes, et cetera. And, 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 and as the, the world around them changes and, and organizations want to be involved and it's, and it's, it, it must be yeah. never ending. The, the, do you ever feel like you've seen all the situations and then you're constantly reminded you haven't? Yes, actually, I do. There, I mean, like, I can think of one the other day where I was like, oh, my gosh, I didn't even know that this could happen. But you you learn every day. Um, and the beauty of this is that, again, most people are using our marks in a manner because they're excited about the games. So a lot of times you can get people to shift their perspective or shift their engagement, um, given that uh, given that they're excited about the games and they really are trying to do the right thing, we get a lot of requests from educators and from summer camps, people who want to put on educational materials, teach kids, teach community members about Olympicism, about sportsmanship, about the games, the history of the games, Olympic values, a lot of those requests. Um, and it's they're also ones that we work with people on. If it's a non-commercial, educational request and there's no third party sponsors um we do in cases authorize certain us opc ip to be used in that educational context um there are some guide rails around there we would ask that you know such educational materials not be published or available in certain media but educating and promoting and spreading the goodwill of the games is something that we do really want to encourage um, so you do see a pop up in sort of other facilities where people are just excited and trying to do the right thing. They want a summer camp and it's just, it's so perfect because the Tokyo games are the summer. So why wouldn't you have a Tokyo 2020 themed summer camp? Um, it's, it's mo a lot of this stems from excitement. Yeah, which I think the way you, you, you approach it also combined with that theory is gonna make it a whole lot more efficient to to kind of do the things you need to do and 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 so we always try to say if if you can come away from these things where the person you're dealing with is still a still a fan but maybe even more of one um is a is a win so that's that that i consider to be a winner as well and you know it's it's never fun to have a conversation with someone and this especially comes into play dave with regard to businesses who have been using names such as Olympic for a while, there are some out there that we just didn't know about. Um, and sometimes it crosses my desk because someone writes an email and says, hey, is this use of Olympic authorized? And sometimes it crosses my desk because someone filed a trademark application. It, it some, sometimes it crosses my desk because they filed for a local business license with the Secretary of State. And some of those state secretaries reach out proactively and say, hey, is this authorized? Is this, is this something that's allowed? Those conversations can be really challenging, especially if that business has been around for 10 years and we just didn't know about it. So it's something that we really have to work with people and do so in a thoughtful manner um, to make sure that not only our assets are protected, but that we're also hearing them and working them in way, working with them in ways that, you know, at, at least they don't, they, they, they don't, the, the entire process of transitioning a brand, Dave, as you know, is not fun especially an established one. So, you know, it's working with people to try to make that a little bit more, that process go a little bit more smoothly um, and kind of realizing some of the, some of the considerations that may arise. So it's, some of these conversations can be really challenging. It's not always people who are happy to get off the phone with me, but I think at least from my perspective, if, if we can explain why we're doing it the way we're doing it, and if we can keep, you know, if, if the conversations are respectful and they're empowering and they're enthusiastic, I, I think that eventually a lot of people, people do feel a little bit less upset about the message, at least is my hope. Yeah, well, I could, I, I think it does. And I think you've got, you've got a good approach because it's, you have a very delicate situation because you're not just like a normal commercial brand. 
in many ways. I mean, it, it has this enormous history, first of all, and then it has this international aspect to it, and then it has all of these aspects of it's 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 part of our, especially on the, the U.S. side, it's, it's part of our country, so to speak, and people do tend to feel very a part of that. Yeah. Um, and, and that's I, and we saw it sometimes on on, on the, the brand I work for is that it was part of people's lives. You know, they it. it it was there when they got married. It was there when they had their first, yep. you know, it just, and it becomes that connection. And I think you, you it's, it's challenging to walk that line. You seem to do it really well. So it is um, challenging, but it's something that I think is really important. Um, and I think it's something that, you know, we've all heard trademark bully stories. I hate the word bully when it comes to trademark. It's something that terrifies me. Um, and and it's something that you don't you don't want to be associated with that term personally, and you don't want your brand to be associated with that term. Um, the most important thing to me is that you know when when I reach out to people, I see myself as a as an offshoot of this brand, as someone who's you know um, protecting and supporting the brand uh, in the way that the brand should be protected and supported. So we do try to do so with care and concern for the people that we're talking to and and to engender enthusiasm and continued support for the games and for team usa yeah that's it's a, it's amazing so so let, let's let's we touched on this and and i'm glad you 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 stayed on this topic so we could talk about it more fully but there's this thing i wanted to get to about this this rule 40 that i never understood and i'm, I'm curious about it and how it impacts what people do and the purpose of it um, because you do hear about it, and I think there may be a lot of misconception about it. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so Rule 40 is a rule in the Olympic Charter. Um, and okay, I'll, I'm going to back up even a little bit more. Um, around games times, as we discussed before, um, USOP, USOPC sponsors, uh, so Team USA sponsors, domestic sponsors, and uh, Olympic and Paralympic top sponsors are authorized to use USOPC intellectual property. Um, so that could be, you know, Team USA, it could be the Rings, it could be Tokyo 2020, it could be the Aguitos, um, you know, a, a, a variety of USOPC IP those sponsors are authorized to use. On the flip side of that equation, non-sponsors are not authorized to use those brands. Um, and so that is true a truism regardless of whether it's game time or not but as i'm sure you can imagine during games times there's an uptick in people who are using the brands especially people who don't know or um appreciate that the terms olympic and paralympic are brands and there there are brands um so that's kind of one piece um so there's there one thing to consider during the rule 40 period is the use of usopc ip and this is again despite the rule 40 period sorry um but it is not authorized commercially for for a non-usopc sponsor so that's one piece of the puzzle rule 40 as you mentioned um is a rule in the olympic charter it's called the bylaw to rule 40 um and this can affect campaigns um run by what we call an athlete personal sponsor so a sponsor that's a sponsor of an athlete but not necessarily or not a sponsor of usopc in this particular case um the rule 40 period is for a set period of time uh, typically, it runs about 10 days before opening ceremonies and two days after closing ceremonies. It's about the time that the Olympic Village is, is active. Um, and there's there's a parallel to Rule 40 in the IP for, for the IPC, so for, for the Paralympic Games as well. There's a parallel that exists there. Um, and what Rule 40 does is it sets certain guidelines for how a participant's name, image, and likeness can be used during this Rule 40 period. Um, this particular rule complies, applies to all current competitors. So again, if you're not currently competing in the games, uh, the Rule 40 period and the Rule 40 regulations don't apply, um, but it applies to all competitors, coaches, trainers, and officials who are participating in the Olympic Games. Um, and, and in general, what it really kind of means is that, uh, or let me actually just say what Rule 40 says, because that can probably put shed a little bit more clarity on it. So rule 40 states that competitors, team officials, and other team personnel who compete in the Olympic Games may allow their person name, picture, or sports performances to be used for advertising purposes during the games in accordance with the principles determined by the IOC executive board. So the IOC executive board has determined its principles. And in the US, we have um, 
taken those principles and created some domestic guidance for Team USA athletes and for athlete personal sponsors who intend to activate in the United States during the Rule 40 period. Um, at its heart, Rule 40 is an eligibility rule introduced by the IOC for the purpose of maintaining the unique and universal competitive environment offered by the Olympic Games. So the rule helps ensure global protection at the Games and helps maintain the long-term health of the movement. Um, but as, as I mentioned, in the United States, we've kind of taken a different approach to it this year um, rather than what we've done in the past. And I'm excited about this. So there's, there's, there's a new approach? So there is. So um, we have created in the US um, what is called a personal sponsor commitment. So what this does is there is a portal on the USOPC website, on the Team USA website, whereby athletes and personal sponsors can enter into a personal sponsor commitment um, through that portal. So basically what this means is that an athlete can go in, um, can indicate his or her personal sponsors, and those personal sponsors can then, with the athlete, um, execute the personal sponsor commitment. Uh, the personal sponsor commitment is something that we've developed in the United States, and it sets out clear guidelines uh, for what these athlete personal sponsors can and can't do during the Rule 40 period, um, including picture examples, which I've actually found to be some of the most helpful of all the examples. Uh, when you can see a picture of how something operates, it's, it's great. Um, but anyway, so this new system allows current Team USA partners and official Olympic and Paralympic partners to maintain their exclusive marketing rights and to gain enhanced protection uh, for enforcement. While at the same time, the system makes it easier for athletes to engage in marketing by allowing these athlete personal sponsors to obtain permission to use athlete images pursuant to these guidelines that we put forward in these personal sponsor commitments. Um, so that's, that's kind of the system that we're hoping to implement. We're hoping that it can be um, a fair and understood system at the outset, and that this process uh, creates a shared responsibility among personal sponsors and athletes through this contractual me mechanism um, that we hope will not only protect USOP sponsors and, and, the, and the games themselves, but will also allow a streamlined process for, process for athlete marketing in the United States. Well, and it's got to be immensely helpful for everybody involved because they, there's a place they can go to say, I, we used to get you know questions is so and so authorized to do x and it's far easier to be able to look on and go oh yeah they're a sponsor it's okay or oh well yeah they're a sponsor but check with dana or just having that resource of information has got to be useful and and just some some of the predictability in it um especially given the size of sponsors of athletes versus sponsors of the whole team but you know etc yeah, so I mean, our, our hope is that this will be a streamlined process. Our hope is that this will make things easier and clearer. Um, we are really trying to, to have things be clear in a straightforward manner, which is why we have brand usage guidelines, which is why we're trying to do this process. Um, it, the, the, the more, um, I think the more precise and the more succinct that we can be in our communications that are available online and to the public, the easier this is for everyone um, and the more enjoyable. No one wants to hear from me during game time. Like I, I know that my phone call, no one wants to pick up. So, I mean, if we can, if we can, you know, kind of sidestep that process, I think that it'd be a lot better for everyone. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I got to ask you a question because you've used this word a couple of times and I racked my brain to think if I'd ever heard it in all the time involved in marketing and design people you used the word agitos. Oh, okay. Yes. So the Agitos. So the Olympic rings are the symbol of the Olympic Committee and the Agitos are the symbol of the International Paralympic Committee. Um, they exemplify spirit in motion and they are also protected by the Ted Stevens Act. Interesting. Okay. Got to add that new word today. Yeah, that's yeah. So in the United States, we're a steward of that brand as well. And, you know, we 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 protect and enforce that brand in alignment with the with the International Par Paralympic Committee and their guidance. I, I saw one question come through, Dave, that I wanted to touch yeah. on, and it had to do with uh, international issues and jurisdiction. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that this is something that um, a lot of folks may not appreciate or know, but uh, so we are, our jurisdiction at USOPC is United States. Um, every, every country that competes in the games has a National Olympic Committee. 
Um, and that National Olympic Committee, we are a National Olympic Committee, that National Olympic Committee uh, is able, it enforces the rules and regulations of the charter as well as intellectual property in their particular jurisdictions. So my job is very US based, which is uh, so different from what I was doing before I came here. Um, but it creates also kind of an interplay with the NOCs. If we find out about something that seems to be problematic in a different territory, we don't do anything about it, but you can flip it to Canada or Australia and they can handle it appropriately uh, with regard to their statutes and their laws. Well, that's actually one of the things I was going to ask you about because th so there's got to be a Dana in every country on the planet that does what you do. But do you tend to go and work, you know, your Canadian counterparts, so you 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 go back and forth, or do, do you tend to go back and forth with the people in, in Geneva or wherever the IOC brand um, people are? How do you how do you orchestrate that? The vast majority of my international uh, conversation are with the folks in Lausanne, the International Olympic Committee, um, with yeah. regard to things that they see in the U.S. or you know questions that we might have with regard to various Olympic properties. Um, I've touched base with a couple of the other. NOC Dana's, I think, um, just kind of to see see how they're doing and what they're up to, especially during COVID. Um, so that's that's been nice and refreshing. Uh, but no, there's not really as big of an international, at least it's it, our jurisdiction here is in the United States. And so um, that that is really where I protect our brand. And that's really the market that I'm focused on. Do you do you you must have a big team or do you have a very lean team that relies on lots of outside help or how, how do you how do you manage all this workload because it's got to go up and down just in in swells because of when the games are and that's got to be a huge challenge it, and it really is so um our legal team at usopc i'm the only intellectual property you know attorney per se um my partner at usopc she handles kind of our marks in the commercial space so we kind of split this one in half but we work routinely together all the time you know day in and day out because our our lives cross over so so commonly in this space um but during games times, you know, we do have a couple of other folks that help out. I am, I actually think that I'm going to have a decent amount of help during the games. And um, well, this is the first one that I have been a part of. I'm very, very excited to be a part of it. But Dave, it's one of those things. I don't know. We're going to see what the volume is. I mean, we're going to, we're going to see. And I, I will, I will see if more Danas are needed in the future. <laughs> yeah, true. So does that mean during the games you would go to Tokyo or you would stay here because the work you do is more focused here? That's exactly right. So during the games, as you might expect, is one of our biggest times where people use our marks and, you know, again, oftentimes in a celebratory manner, but they're things that we need to address in real time on the ground. Um, so me and what I call my kind of the, the folks who are helping me with protecting our brands during the games time, uh, we are located in the States and uh, we are going to, you know, can, work to protect the brands and uh, field people's complaints and field inquiries and uh, handle takedowns and handle, you know, conversations we're asking people to transition off of a mark. So we will be, the, that particular part of our team will be focused in the United States during games time. Yeah, it's going to be a busy time, I think. So you had mentioned for, uh, that there's a number of materials on the, the website. Which website are you talking about? The, the US USOPC. So it's Team USA. That's our website. Um, Team USA, I think it's .org. Pretty sure. Eek, I should know that. Yes, I'm pretty sure it's TeamUSA.org. Um, but one of the things that I would really encourage people to look at are their brand usage guidelines. Um, we really try in those guidelines to address a lot of the questions that we get on a daily basis. For example, one of those guidelines includes questions about artwork. I get fan art all the time about the rings and the agitos and new brands that people want to create. It's it's inspiring that people are inspired by our marks, but we we can't authorize simulations of our brands and we're going to ask you not to use it too. So so it's something that, you know, we try to we try to really be clear and succinct on our brand usage guidelines to give people guidance. And then um, as I mentioned, my email or the legal IP email address is on there. So if you have a question after reading the brand usage guidelines, please feel free to reach out and ask. Um, we're happy to respond. Um, there's also the Rule 40 portal. If there are any athletes or any personal sponsors who are interested in that program and haven't looked into it yet, that's also on our website on Team USA. Um, there's a link to it, and you can, there's also materials associated with it, so you could access some of the pictures and uh, reference materials that I touch base on. 
that's really helpful having those things. So, hey, listen, we, we're, we're, we've, we've kind of chewed up most of an hour here and it's been a fascinating conversation. I just, it's, it's such an interesting area. You're, what you do is interesting, it's so timely um, and it's such a huge issue in the sports world for people. So um, thank you so much for, for joining us today and we'll look forward to, to watching the Olympics and that type of thing. Um, thank you so much for having us. This has been a pleasure. Yeah, sometimes it'd be nice to do it in person and actually have a fire for the fireside chat. And I was waiting for that graphic to come up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they couldn't see, see, figure that one out quite as easily here. So anyway, thanks, Dana, so much. Have a great weekend. Um, and at this point, I want to bring onto the conversation uh, Kara Duckworth, who is the uh, chief communication officer for the USPTO. Hi, Kara. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much, Dave and Dana. Wow, <laughs> what a wonderful and enlightening and incredibly timely conversation. I mean, thank you so much for sharing all of that wisdom today with our audience. What a great way to sail into our weekend. Um, I'm, like Dave said, I'm Kara Duckworth. I'm acting chief communications officer at the USPTO. Uh, I'm sure there are many people tuned in who did so because of the Olympic and Paralympic brand. And you know exactly what it is. You know the Olympic rings, the, the Paralympic agitos, and what that stirs in you. We're all connected by the excitement we feel surrounding the games. And I know I can remember as a young kid growing up glued to the TV with my family, like so many families, watching the games, cheering on the American team, feeling such a sense of pride and wonderment. And I look forward to doing that again in, in July uh, with my family. So the, the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee is really a true steward of this important brand and all, of, all that it represents. There's a lot of value in that. Brands matter, trademarks matter, and protecting them as, as Dana and Dave discussed today matters even more. I hope some folks who tuned in today are inspired to perhaps create another Olympic sized brand uh, to earn the trust of the public to provide so much value to communities the way USOPC does. And as Dave mentioned, um, and Steve mentioned, USPTO will soon be launching our sports and trademarks campaign. So stay tuned for some more great information about the importance of trademarks in the sports economy. Um, please follow us at, US, at USPTO on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and Facebook for more updates. And finally, this year marks the 75th anniversary of the Lanham Act, the primary federal trademark law in the United States. And we have a few upcoming events to mark the celebration, including one next week, which will feature remarks from Dave, who you heard from here today, as well as Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo. Andrew Hirschfeld performing the functions and duties of the USPTO director. So please visit our website at www.uspto.gov and check out our public events on our homepage. And for more information on trademarks and how to register a trademark, how to protect your trademark, check out the trademark basics page of uspto.gov. Thanks again and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dana.